One of the hardest things to do as a beginner in programming is read other people's code. And the annoying thing is reading other people's code is so, so, so vital to programming. Like that is literally how you get better. You don't start off as a beginner just being absolutely phenomenal by just writing your own code the way that you want to write code. You need to write other people's code to get better. So here we are today sitting down to make this video because I want to tell you guys what the secret to reading code is, or at least what I think my secret to reading code is. It's coffee. Imagine that. <laughs> Uh, it's a Sunday, kill me. And this by no means applies just to C++, by the way. We're gonna be looking at C++ code just as an example here today, but this applies to everything. And that is, would now be a good time to put in the sponsorship mention? Mm, nah, I'll do it later. Anyway, enough fluff. Execute the code. Run the code. Stop just reading the code as if it was some kind of book that you picked up and you're just flipping through the pages as if it's paper, you're just reading it. Don't do that. Load it up in an IDE. Load it up in some kind of like execution environment that has a debugger and just run it. Just run it, put breakpoints in, use the debugging like code flow commands, like step into, step over, all of that stuff to just kind of go through the code as it's running. I mean, you can think about it this way. When you run the code, you're actually getting the computer to do what the program is meant to do, right? So you, the computer is actively literally doing what the program is doing. Like the program has programmed the computer to do something. You're literally watching it do stuff. You're watching it happen. So if you can just kind of like be like, whoa, slow down there, cowboy. Let's just hit the brakes for a second. I'm gonna tell you when you can do the next thing and I wanna watch you do it. That's literally what you're doing when you run your code through a debugger. Like that's literally what's happening. And at that point, you can of course examine the entire state of your memory. You can see what the variables are set to. You can see which functions are being called. You can see how you ended up in a certain function by putting a breakpoint in there, assuming the program hits it. You can easily see where the entry point of the program is and what it does in the beginning. And it's even a much better way to trace back and find where certain areas of code are actually written. All of these examples that I just mentioned, we're gonna take a look at today here in this video. But first, don't click away, don't skip, because this is, this is gonna be useful, this is gonna be important. This video is sponsored by Brilliant.org. And the reason why I didn't want you to skip is because I just want you to know that currently Brilliant.org have a 30 day free trial. Free trial, 30 days. Everything I'm about to say, you can experience for free for 30 days. So just check it out, link below. Brilliant is an amazing website filled with lots and lots of really, really good high quality courses on various STEM topics. There are specifically two areas that interest me and that I think can help you. And that is their computer science courses. They have some really, really good introductory computer science courses that can help you. If you're just kind of starting your programming journey, you wanna ease into it in a really easy to understand visual way. But then also their math courses. Oh, what do I say about their math courses? Their math courses are brilliant. I actually said that naturally. It just happens to be the name of the platform as well. Math in and of itself can be quite a complicated topic. And believe me when I say that Brilliant presents it in just such a beautiful, easy to understand way because all of their courses present information visually and interactively. Yeah, that's right. They have widgets that you can play with. They have like UI controls you can slide around so that you can see the impact that different numbers have on a graph, for example. How do integrals work? Well, look, it's here. You can play with it. So I just think it's a really good, effective way to learn. But also the way their courses are divided are really bite-sized. So it's really easy to get through quickly if you don't have much time. And they'll actively quiz you. They'll ask you questions all along the way to make sure that you're paying attention and retaining the information. And all of these features added up together just make a fantastically effective learning platform for math and computer science and they also have other stem topics as well so go ahead and check them out as i mentioned 30 day free trial brilliant.org slash the churno as always the first 200 subscribers will get 20 percent off an annual membership link will be in the description below thank you brilliant for sponsoring this video all right so back to talking about reading code i have three examples for you okay my first example i was doing a code review a while back this is of like a ray tracer i want to use this just as an example to show that when you have a function here that calls an object somewhat indirectly. So in other words, if we take a look at this actual code, there are plenty of different objects here, right? We have like just the base class object, and then we have all these other classes like mesh, which a mesh is an object. We have a sphere, which is an object. We have a plane, which is an object. If we just go back to this piece of code that we're interested in, and we wanna see what on earth intersect object actually does, if I try and go to the definition, you can see how many definitions there are. 
Like it can be really difficult to see if any of them are even in use. If I'm rendering a scene, like which one, which function here applies to what I'm actually visually seeing? Because presumably I wanna find out how what I'm seeing is working, how it's actually happening. So what I can do is instead of like, instead of like trying to go through all of that and find that code, if I just put a breakpoint on this line of code and just run this program, when we hit this line of code, our debugger will pause the program, of course, and then I can do a few things. First of all, immediately, you can see the glorious context I'm presented with in the call stack, right? Like I can immediately kind of see how I got there from invoking main to the actual main function itself into scene render, into scene launch workers, render a cast ray, and then render a trace. Like I suddenly have so much more context. Imagine trying to piece this together just in your head. Like it's a complete nightmare if you've never seen the code base before. And this kind of thing is a trick that I use all the time when I'm reading other people's code for those code review videos that you're seeing on my channel. But it doesn't stop there. If I now wanna see which specific intersect object function is actually being called, I can just use the step into button over here or press F11. When I press that, you can see it steps me into sphere intersect object. So I know that I'm rendering spheres and this seems to be the exact kind of math that's happening. I can kind of read through that and learn from it. But again, it gets better because check this out. All of this kind of context here, like for example, if I'm just reading this code, like position minus ray origin, like L dot dot product ray direction, what's L? Like these kind of parameters can be difficult to kind of digest, right? But check this out. I can hover over ray drop this down, see what the actual numbers are, go through this line by line, like obviously see the result of all of these variables, see which branches are hit. And by the way, this is exactly why I would not write this like that. I always drop these down. If it's a one line if statement with no curly brackets, drop it down like this because then you can actually see which branch is being hit. I mean, in this case, obviously we'll know if it hits this because we'll return from the function, but I'm talking about like all if statements like this, for example, no real way to tell if that's hit without actually kind of stepping through it. Anyway, if I keep going, you can see that was in fact hit, right? Because I'm over here now, I'm gonna return from the function. So D2 was in fact greater than R2. And again, I can look at the numbers. I can see exactly what's happening. And that of course can help you tremendously when you're actually reading and trying to understand the code. Now, if we just hit F5 to run this again, there's another trick that you can use in this specific circumstance, because if you press F11, what it might actually do is if there's like a huge chain here, it might actually step you into the get function. Now, for whatever reason it didn't, I think get, I think because get is actually not it's part of the standard library. This is like probably what even is I? So I, you can see auto I objects begin. We can see that I is a unique pointer. Again, the debugger helping us there. Not too difficult to work that out from kind of looking at object vector and seeing that it's a vector of unique pointers. But anyway, if you want to avoid stepping into functions you're not interested in, you can actually right click and then go to this step into specific menu option where you can see it presents us with a few different functions we can step into. Now here we can step into this dereference operator that's on the iterator class, which will return the object itself. We can go into unique pointer get, or we can go into this indirect call. It's an indirect call because it's a virtual function. So if we click on this guy, it takes us exactly into where we are. In this case, we're intersecting a plane. So that helps a lot. Now, whilst we're in this project, I wanna show you guys one more thing. The way that this guy wrote this, which I pointed out in my code review, which was a, a little bit weird, is basically if we're in a debug build, we do this on one thread. And if we're in a release build, we dispatch a whole bunch of worker threads to kind of do this multi-threaded. So I'll switch over to release just because I wanna show you a multi-threaded example. Once I hit this breakpoint, you can see that because it is a multi-threaded example, the context has kind of changed. This call stack is now showing that we're not coming from the main function, we're coming from this thread invoke, which runs this render worker. But what I can actually do to, again, learn more about the program, understand the program more and the code, is I can go to debug windows and then parallel stacks, which is over here. And if I do that, it'll open up this useful window which shows all of my running threads. So the call stacks for all of the threads because they're all suspended obviously. And it'll show you exactly what they're doing, like their call stack, right? So you can see, for example, the main thread is just sleeping. It's sleeping inside this launch workers function. And in fact, I can double click on that if I wanna take a look at that line of code exactly. So I can see, okay, sleep for 10 milliseconds. Okay, now I know how this program has decided to wait for all of the threads to kind of finish. But you can see the rest of the threads in the entire program here. Like we can see that this guy, this 
This guy over here is doing render a trace and it's inside the intersect object function. Again, I can double click on it if I want to go to that. We have like this function, which is like inside acceleration structure. We've got another thread here. I mean, all these threads are basically doing trace or they're inside cast ray, but you kind of get the point. It's a really powerful and easy way to see how this kind of program is actually coming together, the architecture of the program. Now, actually, example 1.5, because I just thought of this, one more useful way that you can use that parallel stacks window as well is if we go to Hazel, this is going to be Hazel's runtime. If I run Hazel's runtime and specifically Dichotomy, a game that we made for Last Autumn Dare, which is a game jam for those of you who don't know, you can see this is the actual like game being played. If I just, with this game running, just hit pause, it's going to suspend all the threads, obviously, and it's going to show me the call stack of this. So I can actually kind of get some information on how on earth this is running right? And what everything's doing. And if I go into debug windows, parallel stacks, I can also get some information on how all of the different threads inside Hazel are actually working together in that particular moment. So you can see, for example, that the main thread is just inside render thread block until render complete, because it's just waiting on the render thread to finish. The render thread over here looks like it's inside some Vulkan command pool. Basically, it's trying to upload data to the GPU into a storage buffer. And then we have like the audio thread, which is just sleeping. I can easily kind of see the architecture of Hazel as well, all the way down to main to see how this application kind of comes together. Really, really useful stuff that helps you understand how this code is actually written and how this program works. And hopefully you can see that if you contrast this to just, you know, reading the code just with your eyes, how big of a difference there really is and how much easier it is to understand how this works. Okay, the second example is this. This actually happened the other day. I was doing a code review and I wanted to demonstrate that Unique Pointer basically did the same thing as New and Delete. It just kind of automates it. It makes it a little bit more foolproof. So we have this entity class. We have us making a Unique Pointer. I basically kind of wanted just to prove that in the beginning when we kind of call Make Unique, well, what does it do? Let's take a look at its definition. I'll hit F12 in Visual Studio. It brings me to the code. Now it's standard C++ library code, so... Yeah, it's a little bit hard to read as it is. And again, for a beginner, good luck, mate. Poor young Cherno struggling with this. To all the young Chernos out there, I salute you. This is not alcohol. Anyway, so you can see very clearly that the make unique function over here, it takes in our arguments in case we have any for the constructor. It calls new on the type that we make unique with. So in this case, that would of course be the entity type. It calls new entity and it passes along any of the arguments that we have into that constructor if there are any. Very easy to read, not a problem. No need to run the code to see that. However, <laughs> I wanna show it calling delete because I know it calls delete. Right, unique pointer just calls new and delete for you, right? So how do I show that? Well, back in, uh, you know, the unique pointer class inside this memory header file, here it is, memory, this is a nice uh, intimidating header file. If I like, you know, if I try and find like the destructor for unique pointer, I'm gonna cheat and use visual assist here, alt M. Uh, and then if I put in like a little squiggly line here, <laughs> I know that's going to be the destructor. And oh look, here's the unique pointer destructor. Yeah, that should call delete, right? Um, well, I mean, it calls if my pair dot my val to my pair dot get first, and then this looks like the it like get gets that and then uses like the call operator or something on it. Like what is going on? And again, like, you know, as a beginner looking at this code, like, well, I guess I can go to get first. That returns this. Oh, what class am I in now? Oh, I'm in like a compressed pair. Of course I am. Like what is, what is even happening? And why is it calling that? Like, uh, well, how does this work? Well, I'm going back to our code. Let's execute this and see how it works. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a destructor inside entity. Right, and then I'm just gonna put a breakpoint like right here. You could write some code here, like a print line or something. You could put debug break. There's many different ways to do this. I can just put a breakpoint over here on the opening parenthesis. Of course, make sure you're in debug as always. Hit F5. It's going to compile our code, and then we've of course hit the breakpoint, presumably at the end of this. Let's have a look at the call stack because guess what? How do we call the destructor? we call delete on that object, right? So if we go to the call stack and we look at this, you can see that this is us invoking main right over here. Then we go into the unique pointer destructor. We were just there, right? So I was right. Here it is the unique pointer destructor we looked at. But then after that, we go into like this SCD default delete operator. And look, you can see here that it, it is in fact that call operator that I was talking about. Let's double click on that and take a look at this delete pointer. So it does in fact call delete normally, as you would expect. We pass in the pointer we're trying to delete. It goes into the call operator. This is in the default delete struct. And what it will do is call delete. And you can see just how easy it was for us to find this exact code 
by just using the tools we have available to us. We run the code, we put a breakpoint into where we know it will eventually end up, and then we trace it back using the call stack. Really, really effective. Now, as a side note, this might beg the question of like, why is it so complicated? Why does this not just delete points normally? The reason why is because Unique Pointer is a little bit more flexible. You can actually provide a custom deleter if you want. If you don't want it to call delete, you have like some special shutdown procedure for whatever reason it needs to call that, you can pass that in like as a template argument and it will kind of go through that process for you. That's why it's not necessarily assumed that this will happen, but rather this is just a default deleter. So there are, there are reasons technically why it's this complicated, but of course, if you're new and you have no idea how anything works, it is really hard to track that down. Okay, and finally, last example, example number three, this is gonna be a quick one. Unreal Engine 5, nothing quick about this, am I right? But anyway, suppose you're trying to read through the code of Unreal Engine 5. Now this is really, really difficult to do to the point where I would probably begin with the documentation to kind of go through the actual technical documentation of how this is architected rather than trying to read the code per se, but, here we are, we're in a solution with 122 projects, which is quite a lot. What do we do? Uh, we could start kind of, I guess, going through this and trying to read it. Maybe I can do a search here for like, I don't know, the word main or something to try and find the main function. Like how on earth do you even begin with this? Well, I'll tell you how. Just hit F10 on your keyboard or go to debug and then either step into F11 or step over, doesn't really matter. I'm just gonna hit F10. I of course have already compiled Unreal Engine 5 because if I hadn't, then this process would take hours. All right, and then when it finally runs, we will see this. So I had no files open before, right? This was completely blank. It's automatically by itself opened this launch windows.cpp file, right? And look at this. We're at the beginning of WinMain, the entry point of the whole program. I can now just go through this normally by like hitting F10. We can see here that it's going into the launch windows startup function. Again, F11 will take us into here. I can go through this line by line and actually get a sense of how Unreal Engine starts up. All of the initialization code I can kind of go through. I can obviously use the same techniques I used from example one, where I can see what the variables are set to. I can place a breakpoint inside a function that I'm interested in. And then when the engine or the program eventually hits that function, I can trace it back, see the call stack. Gives you like at the very least with something as big as Unreal Engine, some kind of starting point where we can kind of see what on earth it does in its initialization and how it like, you know, eventually goes into guarded main, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Hope you guys enjoyed the video. If you did, a like would be much appreciated. I really hope this advice was able to help some people because I just remember back in the day, I really used to struggle with this. And if someone had just said this, I would probably be out and about reading other people's code a lot more instead of constantly trying to write my own instead because reading foreign code was just too difficult. Little sidetrack, by the way, the way that I used to read code as a beginner was I literally remember printing out pages of code. I printed out pages of code. This was back like in high school. I was really into programming. In fact, I was so into it that I printed out all this code, put it into a display folder, took it with me to camp in like well, like year 11 or something. I was like 16 at the time and read it like with a flashlight, like with a torch. I read it in my tent at night, like paper, Java code on paper. Yeah, I, uh, yeah, I definitely should have just ran the code.